Muy buenos días y bienvenidos a este nuevo webinar de Avevión, emisiones de la biomasa. ¿Se están contabilizando bien? Yo soy Jorge Benito, soy técnico de Avevión y seré el encargado del control técnico de este evento. Ahora ya quiero dar paso a, a Javier Díaz, el presidente de Avevión, que nos hará una pequeña introducción sobre el tema de las emisiones de la biomasa. Muy buenos días a todos. Para Avevión la verdad es que es muy importante el tema que vamos a tratar hoy porque... Eh, bueno, pues eh, eh, se, hacen, se hacen comentarios, eh, eh, se dejan de hacer cosas pensando que en algunas zonas eh, la biomasa eh, está contaminando con partículas y realmente eh, hoy se va a ver claramente que esas, eh, eh, esa evaluación de, de, de las partículas que se emiten eh, con los equipos modernos de biomasa no son, no son así. Eh, Avevión, como sabéis, está fundada en el año 2004 eh, para promover el desarrollo del sector de la, de la biomasa en, en España. En este momento tenemos 160 empresas asociadas con una facturación conjunta de 2.200 millones y, y más de 11.000 puestos de, de trabajo. Eh, hacemos bastantes cosas, ¿verdad? Eh, entre ellas la feria Expo Biomasa, que este año se celebrará eh, a finales del mes de septiembre. Eh, tenemos un, una publicación eh, Biomasa News con las últimas noticias sobre el sector, eh, organizamos el Congreso Internacional de Bioenergía, el Observatorio, tenemos el Observatorio Nacional de Instalación de Calderas, Biomasa en tu casa y temas como el canal clima eh, eh, para, para eh, remunerar un poco las emisiones evitadas por los equipos de, de biomasa instalados por nuestros socios y eh, eh, gestionamos la certificación de calidad de los PELET en Plus en, en España y eh, Biomasur también. Son temas realmente importantes que nos preocupan muchísimo y que tienen mucho que ver también con el tema de las emisiones. Eh, eh, la calidad de los, de los biocombustibles sólidos es muy importante y eh, también, como veis ahí, el, el certificado de instalador de biomasa que lo que buscamos es que haya profesionalidad en, en esa instalación. Entonces, eh, cada, cada año eh, estamos viendo que en toda la Unión Europea se realizan inventarios de contaminantes del aire en base a factores de emisión, que dada la, comple la complejidad de la tarea, eh, se realizan en muchos casos simplificaciones y supuestos eh, metodológicos. Al sobreestimar el número de chimeneas en uso, eh, ejemplo, chimeneas que puede haber en París, en, en, en Londres, en Países Bajos, estamos encontrando eh, casos eh, de la biomasa con emisiones de partículas PM10 y PM2.5 generadas por los sistemas de calefacción que se han sobreestimado de, eh, debido al reparto erróneo de, de esos datos. Las calderas y las estufas de biomasa modernas generan muchas menos emisiones de las que se asignan de forma global a la calefacción con biocombustibles de origen leñoso. El problema está en que eh, se contabilizan los antiguos equipos de leña que es necesario sustituir. Estudio, el estudio que, que va a presentar Christoph Smidel no es eh, el primer caso en que se detectan errores de asignación de emisiones a la biomasa. Eh, en el Reino Unido eh, se habían sobreestimado las emisiones de PM2,5 y la cifra real era un tercio de lo estimado inicialmente para la combustión. Ahí tenéis eh, eh, los enlaces de los artículos y un vídeo. En Países Bajos también se habría sobreestimado la cantidad de PM2.5 causadas por la biomasa en un 25%, eh, al descubrir que las chimeneas y otros aparatos de biomasa se habían retirado de, del uso. Tenéis el, el enlace del artículo también en, 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 ese, en, ese, en ese punto. Eh, por otro lado, se detectan numerosos errores en referencias a diferentes factores para, para varios Estados miembros de la Unión Europea y factores anticuados en la guía para monitorizar eh, las emisiones de la Agencia Europea del Medio Ambiente. La clave es la sustitución de calderas, estufas eh, obsoletas, de leña, de gasóleo, de, de gas natural, eh, por nuevas de, de peles o otros biocombustibles sólidos certificados eh, eh, que como veis en el cuadro adjunto eh, han 
siempre bajado eh, 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 según una evolución tecnológica muy, muy, muy importante, han rebajado el nivel de las emisiones desde los años 80 hasta la actualidad eh, de manera importantísima. Es un sector muy activo en este tema y, eh, como digo, se han rebajado muchísimo las, las emisiones. Eh, los factores que inciden en las emisiones de la combustión eh, eh, en general y de la biomasa en particular eh, son muy claros. La calidad del biocombustible, eh, la regulación y el mantenimiento de los equipos, hay que, estar, eh, eh, hay que atender los equipos, hay que mantenerlos en condiciones el nivel tecnológico del equipo principal, como hemos visto anteriormente, y el diseño y ejecución de la, de la instalación. Esos son temas eh, eh, muy importantes. Para el funcionamiento de una caldera eh, de biomasa, para que sea óptimo y las emisiones las mínimas, es indispensable un biocombustible de calidad y unas características físico-químicas constantes a lo largo del tiempo. Los sistemas de certificación de biocombustibles eh, por entidades independientes eh, eh, como en Plus o como Biomasud se basan en estándares internacionales de calidad ISO y UNE y tienen un sistema de gestión de calidad similar al ISO 9000 que asegura que los valores eh, se cumplen de forma constante. ¿no? Ahí tenéis la incidencia de las condiciones de operación en la emisión de partículas. Eh, tenemos la, la, la operación óptima eh, la operación típica y la, la mala operación. Y, y se puede ver clarísimamente la diferencia que hay de unas a otras. Por lo tanto, eh, operar la instalación en condiciones es realmente muy importante. Eh, se están contabilizando, eh, eh, en algunos casos se están contabilizando eh, las emisiones de una forma poco, poco, digamos, poco seria porque se están metiendo eh, en un cajón desastre eh, eh, chimeneas abiertas, estufas con tecnologías obsoletas, incluso eh, quemas de rastrojos, que no tienen nada que ver con, con, con lo que es la biomasa tecnificada que nosotros estamos proponiendo desde hace, desde hace años. La tecnología de biomasa actual, con calderas de tecnologías avanzadas, con funciones automatizadas, el cumplimiento con el ecodiseño en vigor desde 2020 para las calderas y que entrará en vigor en el 2022 para las estufas es algo realmente importante. El control y mantenimiento sencillo, ejemplo, pues oye, encender la, las calderas por SMS, en fin. El rendimientos energéticos altos eh, por encima del 85% y el 95% de eficiencia, eh, según marca el RITE. Combustibles, como decíamos anteriormente, estandarizados, pellet, hueso de aceituna, astillas. Hoy por hoy tenemos en el mercado todo tipo de biocombustibles sólidos que están certificados y que tienen una garantía de estabilidad en la calidad. Y algo que, que también comentábamos, a pesar de tener una buena caldera de última tecnología, muy con biocombustibles certificados, es vital que la instalación esté diseñada por profesionales con experiencia en biomasa. No todo vale, hay que hacer las cosas bien. Hay multitud de factores que pueden influir en la calidad del aire. Si no se diseña correctamente esa instalación, tiene que estar bien dimensionada, tienen que tener transporte de, de pellet o biocombustibles sólidos eh, 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 sin codos, eh, sin complicaciones, no demasiado largos, el almacén debe estar eh, es seco, sin humedades y sin eh, posibilidad de, de entrada de objetos extraños y demás. Por lo tanto, eh, en Avebión hemos puesto en marcha ya hace un año el, el sello de, de, de instalador de biomasa térmica certificado y estamos intentando dar formación en esa línea a los instaladores para evitar esos, esos posibles problemas de, de, de esos instaladores que no están familiarizados con la instalación de, de biomasa. Eh, con esto os dejo directamente con el, el, el doctor Smidel, que es el que nos va a poner al corriente de, de, de estos temas. Muchísimas gracias y que disfrutéis de, de ello, sirva la, la presentación. Muchas gracias. Y vamos a dar paso ya al, al ponente de hoy. Christoph Smidel es doctor por la Universidad Tecnológica de Viena, 15 años investigando el uso energético de la biomasa, su carrera profesional lo llevó de la Universidad Tecnológica de Viena al Centro de Investigación BEST, donde ahora trabaja como, como investigador clave. 
Además, dirige un programa de máster en sistemas de energía renovable y gestión técnica de energía y representa a Austria en un grupo de trabajo del Programa de Colaboración Tecnológica de la Agencia Internacional de Energía. Buenos días, Cristo. Ok, thank you uh, and welcome to this presentation. Welcome from Austria. Um, thank you for this invitation. Uh, what I can um, present to you today is the lessons learned from Austria on the topic emissions from biomass combustion. Um, maybe some background information at the beginning. The climate policy and the energy policy in Austria has significantly changed last year. The Green Party was entering the government in 2020 and this turned out to be some kind of game changer in the energy policy. Climate action is now in the real focus of the governmental agreement. It's the biggest chapter in that document with more than 60 pages on actions for saving our climate. And one of the main points in this program is to phase out domestic oil heating quite soon. So um, not only for new buildings, which was already in place before, but also for existing buildings, existing systems, uh, there is an ambitious time frame for changing out these systems. So for instance, in new building, it's forbidden to install oil heatings from 2020 onwards. For heating system change, so refurbishment, it's forbidden from 2021, so from this year on. And starting from 2025, um, we have to replace oil boilers that are older than 25 years. And finally, until 2035, so in 14 years from now, 15 years it was um, last year, um, we have to replace, we will replace oil, all heating oil boilers in Austria, which are approximately 500,000 boilers. Um, and from 2036 on, there should not be any domestic oil heating system in place anymore. Maybe some more background on the situation in Austria now. Biomass is the most important renewable energy source in Austria with um, contributing approximately 60% of the renewable energy. And um, it will also play, and that's clear now, one of the central roles in the further transformation of the energy system. Furthermore, the importance of biomass um, for the climate protection is, I would say undisputed. Um, I, I put that brackets um, a few days uh, before because there is some, some um, discussion on the European level going on about um, sustainability of biomass use, energetic biomass use. Um, I would say the situation in Austria is somehow different because um, we have a long tradition and history of the use of uh, wood for energy purposes with a very strict regulation and law uh, on forest management. So um, I think in Austria, the, the, the feeling in the, in the, uh, both in the government, but also uh, for the people is clear that um, we are using our forests, our wood uh, in a sustainable way. We can show that our forests are growing, that the stock in our forests is, forest is growing since uh, decades. Uh, so I think the discussion here on international level is somehow different from the Austrian local or, or uh, governmental level. But there comes a big but, wood burning systems are also criticized in Austria for their emissions. So the main research questions question for our work was how this decarbonization of our heating sector that is now put into force uh, with this uh, governmental program will affect dust emissions in Austria or fine dust emissions in special. So what we considered uh, in our studies was first of all what is the status of dust emissions today and even more important how will that develop by 2050. This was done um, before we knew that in the new governmental program, we want to focus on 2040 already. So the de full decarbonization of the Austrian energy system should now be finished by 2040. So even a more ambitious time frame. Now, what was done to answer that questions? 
Um, and this is also the content of my presentation today. First, we try to uh, figure out what is the status of particle emissions today. And we did together with colleagues, some international and national studies on real life emission measurements of modern biomass heating systems, just to obtain realistic emission factors and to compare them with the default values, with the used values uh, in emission inventories. What we also did is uh, uh, some kind of recalculation of the in emission inventory of Austria based on these new research findings um, of several studies. And to go a step further and to start the outlook, uh, colleagues from the Vienna University of Technology um, set up some kind of scenario, renewable energy scenario, uh, focusing on a pathway how the heating sector can be decarbonized by 2050. As I mentioned, now the target is already 2040, so even quicker decarbonization of that sector. And by combining that knowledge uh, about emission factors of modern systems and these pathways uh, towards decarbonization, um, we can answer the question, how will particle emissions develop in that time frame? And finally, uh, what was done just uh, in a very small study with the help of one uh, or two boiler manufacturers is um, to show the effect of boiler change out on carbon dioxide and particle emissions for just randomly selected cases over, over Austria. And this is what I would like to show you in the next uh, few minutes. Just the references, um, all the information uh, in that presentation is published, is based on scientific uh, studies or uh, official data from the government. So if you're interested, um, you can go into the details. Some of them is only available in German, but if you are interested, just contact me and I can provide you some further information on all the, all the reference material here. Now, when you ask the question, what's the status of fine dust emissions, um, you first have to uh, know how emission inventories are working. So what is the basic principle of emission inventories? Um, and on a first view, that's quite simple. Um, an emission inventory just adds up the emissions of environmentally relevant substances over a certain period of time. Usually this is one year. Uh, and you do that, um, for different sectors, for instance, transport, industry, agriculture, but also residential sector, uh, combustion uh, or, or heating sector. How to calculate? Um, th this is um, also a straightforward approach. The total emission of a certain compound is emission factor multiplied with some kind of activity coefficient. Or uh, as an example, if you want to know the dust emissions, you need the emissions in kilogram dust per terajoule of fuel that you burn multiplied with the fuel consumed in that year in terajoule. And what you get out is the kilograms dust emission in total. Now, a few years ago, until a few years ago uh, in Austria, this calculation was done on for the, the sector of domestic heating with biomass with just one emission factor for all biomass fuels and all types of combustion. So just one calculation, very simple, but um, with a lot of uncertainties, of course. Today, uh, and since now several years, uh, Austria is making it in a different way. We have different emission factors, depending on the fuel, depending on the type of combustion, for instance, is it automatic system, manual system? Is it old? Is it new technology? Which type of technology? And with different emission factors and the amount of fuel going into these different technologies, you can make separate calculations and then add it up to a total in the end. And this is the result the official Austrian result um, for particulate matter smaller than 10 micrometers. This is this PM10 um, called fraction that is also relevant in the EU legislation. There is a, a threshold for PM10 in the ambient air. And what you can see here is the main sectors 
responsible for emissions, which is industry uh, as the biggest emitter, small scale combustion, residential heating, already the second uh, biggest emitter, agriculture and traffic. Small scale combustion adds up 26% of PM10 in Austria. And when you look into the details of these 26%, you will see that almost 70% in this calculation is coming from so-called mixed fuel boilers, which is actually an old firewood coal technology. So boilers that can fire biomass and coal at the same time, which is definitely outdated technology. In Austria, um, new installation of such boilers is already forbidden since mid of the 90s. Modern systems, so modern boilers, make up only 3.6% and ovens and stoves only 4.3% of the total emissions. You can see that much lower shares for these modern systems. But still, even if this um, calculation is already quite comprehensive with different emission factors and different types of fuels, there are some uncertainties from our understanding and we did an, a very detailed analysis of this calculation. So what are these uncertainties? We found out that um, the assumptions in our emission inventory in Austria um, are cannot be correct for uh, the the, the stock of the systems. So the, the the total system stock seems far too old. The proportion of mixed fuel boilers is, is too high. If you assume a, a lifetime of 40 years, which is quite long, only less than 50% of the Lockwood boilers in the stock can be these old mixed fuel boilers. Remember, since mid of the 90s, they are forbidden in Austria. In the current Austrian inventory, they are calculating that 90% of the logwood boilers are using that technology. This cannot be uh, correct uh, to our understanding. And furthermore, the emission factors that are used are mostly, not all of them, but mostly based on so-called default or standard values in the air pollution emission inventory guidebook. And this means that these are some kind of European average values. Several research projects um, with hundreds of measurements show that the Austrian technologies that are now state of the art are significantly better than several of these European averages. So what was possible for my colleagues, uh, mainly it was Markus Schwarz um, doing that, that uh, research, they could simply uh, recalculate the emission inventory for Austria with uh, careful assumptions about the service life. So they calculated 40 years operation for wood chips and logwood boilers, 30 years for pellets and 20 years for stoves and introduced only for the modern, for the new installations, the emission factors that were found from research projects over the past 10 years. And what turned out um, is that these modern emission uh, factors, uh, the, the emission factors of these modern systems, sorry, um, are for some technologies significantly lower than the used ones. What you can see here is always three bars for different technologies. Um, the left bar is always the emission factor in the Austrian emission inventory. The red one is the, the best in that technology group. So the best oven technology has 160 kilograms per terajoule emission factors. And this light blue emission factor is the one that is based on recent research projects, measurements in the field where modern stoves were tested. And you see there is a big difference for the, for the ovens, also for the firewood boilers, a big difference between the best emission factor that is currently used and the measurements from the field. Also for the wood chip boilers, uh, the only, uh, um, only for the pellet boilers, it seems that um, the emission factors that are used now already nicely fits to uh, what is what is seen on the market or in the field. Now, when you recalculate um, these Austrian numbers now with the realistic stock of appliances and only for the new systems, realistic emission factors, it turns out 
that still small scale combustion is a relevant source. But you see that the mixed fuel boilers, the share of the mixed fuel boilers significantly is reduced. Um, sorry for that wrong translation. This is uh, the gasification boiler, modern Lockwood boilers increases because we are sure that most of the, the much more and most of the Lockwood is now uh, combusted in, in modern or even better systems. But in total, it leads to a re reduction of about 2000 tons per year of PM10 emissions. And this is significant. We were starting with 7,300 and now at 5,300. And what we already see is that from that publication, the Austrian agency performing their uh, or, or pro 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 providing that emission inventory, it's the Austrian Umweltbundesamt, uh, the agency on, on environment, has already changed their emission factor calculation, uh, and the reduction is already will be seen in the next um, in the next inventories. Now, after that look on the current status and maybe also the the critics and the potential optimization of the current status calculation in Austria, we want to go a step further and ask the question, we now decided to phase out heating oil. We will replace 500,000 oil boilers in the next 15 years. And at least a significant share of these replacements will be done by biomass systems. Of course, we will have heat pumps. Um, nobody really knows with how the share is first. First idea is it will be around 50-50% share, but, but this needs to be shown in the next years. But there will be a significant um, contribution uh, from the, for these 500,000 boilers from biomass systems. Now, how could this extensive decarbonization of the space heating sector uh, look like was the first question. What's, what's um, the prognosis of the energy system in the next years? And the colleagues at Vienna University of Technology modeled the building stock in Austria and simulated the energy technology mix on that way to this decarbonization of the space heating sector by 2050, and also um, developed measures to achieve that goals. The result was um, that oil and coal have to um, be phased out, as already mentioned. We also need a significant reduction in natural gas use and the rest have to be switched to renewable gas. The electricity, direct electricity heating, which is still um, quite common, uh, you see that uh, in the 2015 line here, has to be reduced. At the same time, the heat pump technology is significantly increasing in that time. It's the sharpest increase that is foreseen in that scenario. But also for biomass heating systems, there is an increase from 20 to 30% approximately. And this is based on the shares of heated living space in Austria. One thing that you have to keep in mind is that we are starting from a quite big share of biomass heating um, in, the, uh, in the residential sector. In... Okay, I can now hear the Spanish translation. Okay, um, when you put that, um, when you put that scenario now in absolute figures, this were the, the, the slide before these were relative figures until 2050. If you put that scenario into absolute figures, you can see that one of the keys for the decarbonization of the heating sector is the reduction of energy that is required for that sector. So the energy efficiency of buildings both by thermal renovation, but also by new, new construction, um, new buildings uh, is one of the keys to achieve that goal. So the heating demand by 2050 was estimated to be reduced by 50% almost. And in that scenario, uh, it leads to a higher relative share of biomass in the heating sector, also a higher number of installed systems, but a lower fuel consumption in total. And we took that scenario because it's the best available for Austria. Um, it was a, a really big study done by the, by the Vienna University of Technology um, to, to calculate that. And combine that scenario with 
the knowledge about emission factors and uh, emissions of modern systems so that we can estimate um, the course of particle emissions for the next 20 years or 30 years. And this is what you can see on that slide. Um, in the first step, you see the influence of recalculating the existing and official inventory with um, a different stock, a more realistic stock and realistic emission factors. So this is the two first columns. The UBA column here is the official inventory for 2017. And the recalculation leads to a 30, almost 30% 30 decrease just by um, updating, I would say, emission factors and the stock of the systems. And from then on, you see the course of emissions in this scenario, renewable heat. You remember, we have an absolute increase of numbers. We have an increase of um, heated space by biomass, but we have also a reduction in absolute figures. So in total, we come to approximately 90, 86 to 90%, depending on where you start from, um, reduction of particle emissions until 2050 in that scenario. And the main reasons for that reduction are the replacement of outdated systems with modern ones, and of course, also the reduction of uh, the heating demand of buildings, both by thermal renovation and new construction. So these are the two keys to reach that goal, to get rid of particle problem uh, based on biomass combustion. And uh, one thing that I want to add here, we did not include any improvement in technology, which you could expect for that time frame. I mean, we're talking about 20 to 30 years. We took only the existing emission factors for modern systems. We did not include any reduction of emissions, further reduction of emissions in that calculation scenario. So that's, I would even say it's a worst case uh, scenario. Uh, if the technology further improves, this would get even better. And finally, um, as a wish also from, from uh, the manufacturers, they wanted to show that this is not only calculations, that this is real. So what they selected was just 50 cases, 50 systems that were installed in Austria. You see that share over the, over the country from different areas where the replaced old heating systems were surveyed, which type of system, which fuel, the amount of fuel, uh, the age and so on. And of course, the information on the new system that was installed. And we did a calculation on carbon dioxide emissions, so the climate relevant topic and the dust emissions. Everything was calculated with official emission factors of the current Austrian emission inventory. So not the improved ones, but the official ones. And the result, or first, first um, what, what was changed out and what was newly installed in those 50 systems um, were two big fractions. Um, the one is old firewood appliances, logwood boilers, this old technology and heating oil boilers, also some natural gas, some wood chip uh, and one pellet boiler. And the newly installed systems were pellets, 60% wood chips and some firewood, five firewood boilers. So what was the effect of that change out? What we expect is that carbon dioxide emissions are reduced by 70%. And please keep in mind, we are here including the emissions of the fuel provision chains. Um, so all that, that emissions coming from cutting the tree in the forest until the pellet is delivered to the, to the boiler is included uh, into that chain. We are using the emission factor, official emission factors for the whole chain uh, in that calculation. Therefore, there is a rest of carbon dioxide emissions also in the biomass um, system, also for the biomass systems. But at the same time, we reach a dust emission by almost 50%. So um, the discussion that was going on, and, and um, it stopped already in Austria, but it was going on um, if by improving the climate situation, by changing to biomass, we add up another problem in dust emissions is simply not true. This will not happen. And um, this was just shown here for 50 cases, and we are now trying to in in increase that number also to, to a bigger share uh, of the Austrian cases. 
but the trend is, is always clear. It's possible to reduce both carbon dioxide emissions and particle emissions. Now, before I take a very short and, and um, simple view to the Spanish situation, let me conclude and summarize the Austrian lessons. Heat from biomass is the cent plays a central role in the transformation of the Austrian energy system and will play uh, in the future the central role. We also have to admit and be clear that small-scale combustion from biomass is a relevant source of particulate matter. And it will stay a significant role, uh, a significant source for several time. But we also believe that the emission inventory in Austria somehow overestimates the contribution. We are not sure if it is by 20%, by 15 or by 30%, but it over overestimates it. Um, the reduction of carbon dioxide and dust emissions at the same time can be achieved together. The emissions will significantly decrease in, in future, uh, approximately 80 to 90 percent to 2050. If we make it quicker until 2040, um, this will be in the same range, but, but even quicker until, uh, as I mentioned, until 2040. The two keys to achieve that, all that all that conclusions is the replacement of all heating devices has to continue. And we're talking here about boilers and stoves that are simply outdated old technology, not state of the art. And of course, and that's, that's quite a hard job, uh, at least in Austria, is to reduce the space heating requirements, the re thermal renovation of buildings. It's easy for the, for the new buildings because there is a regulation um, about the thermal quality of the buildings but it's quite hard to motivate people to renovate, thermally renovate their buildings. Um, this is something that, that the government is now working on to uh, increase the speed of this renovation. Um, now at the end, um, I, I try to make some, some view on the Spanish situation and this is based on official documents that I found, only some of them are available in English and um, I try to translate the, the Spanish ones, and as my Spanish is has been better in the time when I when I worked in in Barcelona, uh, I I guess I hope that that my conclusions are right, but um, maybe some of of you can can tell me if not. So the current situation in Spain here, given for PM two point five, the reports are focusing on the on the smaller fraction, smaller than two point five micrometers, is that the other stationary combustion, as it is called here. Uh, which is mainly the small scale combustion for residential heating is the, the biggest contributor to this PM 2.5 emissions. The second one um, is industry. Uh, there is some road transport and the sum of, uh, of different sources summed up here is the rest. Um, the most relevant sector for biomass or small scale biomass is of course this other stationary combustion. There are two statements in the report, um, in this big report, um, that are directly focusing on, on small scale biomass combustion. First of all, that the residential stationary combustion is accounting for 40% of the two total PM2.5 emissions. And in the next bullet, this is mainly due to the increase of biomass combustion since um, 2000 within the residential sector. So most of that uh, big fraction coming from um, residential combustion is coming from biomass combustion. Um, what I was interested in is how this is calculated. So what is the method of the emission inventory behind that figures? And there is a, document, a nice document on the uh, methodology available, uh, but all, only in Spanish. So um, I hope that I, I got it right. Um, I took out the table where we see the emission factors used for different um, fuels in residential heating. And what you can see here is for biomass in residential heating, um, the emission factor, I take out here the TSP, which is the total dust, um, the PM10 and PM2.5 are almost 100% fractions of this, of this TSP, is 500 to 800 uh, grams per gigajoule. And this is coming, and the, the reference here is giving this inventory guidebook um, 2019 in tier one and two. Just to explain for those of you who do not know this guidebook and the methodology, um, this guidebook gives different options how countries 
calculate their emission inventories. And there are three possibilities, tier one, two, and three, and they are getting more and more comprehensive. The easiest way is the tier one, which means you have one emission factor that is very common for a whole group of emitters and multiply the total amount of fuel going into that um, sector and multiply it with one emission factor. So it's a simple way. Two, tier two is already having different emission factors for different categories. And the most comprehensive uh, and, and difficult also needs a, a lot of data uh, way, but also the, the best way of course, uh, of calculating uh, emissions is the tier number three. What does that mean? 500 to 800 grams per gigajoule. Just to, to compare these numbers with the Austrian situation, um, Austria is using already, as I mentioned, different emission factors, several. I, I think it's seven or eight different emission factors for different categories, but these are all much lower than the ones that are used in Spain currently. We are using 21 grams per gigajoule for pellet boilers, which is the best emission factor that we use for the modern boilers, up to 164 grams per gigajoule for the stoves. Um, so there is a big difference in the current calculation. Um, of course, it, it can be a big difference also in the stock of appliances, in the use of appliances. The question is, if it's really so big, um, or if there is available data for uh, improving also the emission factors in Spain as technology is continuously improving as new systems are installed. So this update of emission inventories uh, is a very crucial point. Um, and sometimes it's, it's hard to do that for the agencies because there is not enough data available. Um, just an additional slide to show you, um, this is the frame or the range of emission factors in this guidebook. If you do not have your own emission factors, so measured in your country, measured for your appliances, which is always the best way, you can use these default values that are in that guidebook. And you see that it's starting from um, around 30 milligrams or grams per gigajoule for the pellet uh, boilers, going up to 800 or even more uh, for open fireplaces. So these are all different emission factors called tier two emission factors. If you do not have an, a differentiation, you use that tier one, which is just one factor, 800 grams per gigajoule. And what you can display now in this emission factor range is the range that the different countries are using. Uh, as already mentioned, currently Spain, what I found out, I hope that it's, that it's uh, right, is using for residential heatings 500 to 800. So that range is used for, for the Spanish situation and the Austrian situation is between 20 and 164. Uh, there is a, there's a big difference. Um, and I think the, the interesting question is if this is realistic or if it needs some updates also in the Spanish emission inventory um, to account for modern systems that are current, continuously installed and replace old systems. And that's what I can, can tell you um, currently. I, I thank you for your kind attention and I would be happy if uh, I can answer your questions now. Me gustaría destacar un par de puntos de tu, de tu presentación. La metodología actual está sobreestimando las emisiones de la biomasa. Y, y un segundo punto que me parece muy, muy importante es que para reducir la, las emisiones me parece fundamental renovar el, el parque de estufas y calderas que hay actualmente en, en funcionamiento. Los equipos más actuales son más eficientes energéticamente y esto conlleva una reducción de emisiones y también entiendo que, que de coste para, para el usuario. ¿Cuántos subgrupos de sistemas de combustión de pequeña escala se han tenido en cuenta para los nuevos factores de emisión? We are using, the, the emission inventory is using nine different subgroups we changed four of them. So the modern ovens, modern logwood boilers, modern wood chip boilers, and modern pellet boilers. So just se several, some of them were changed, not all of them. But in total, we are using nine. In our recalculation, we changed four of them. Y una segunda pregunta, que sería, ¿mantiene un inventario de pequeños equipos de de combustión de biomasa en su país? I have to admit, we, we do not have a perfect one. 
we are trying on a on a um, provincial level some provinces are quite far with that to do a real inventory on existing systems currently this this is not complete for all austria what we are currently using is um we is good uh, I, mean, I mean we are a research uh, institute uh, the the governmental institute uh, providing that emission inventory is the umweltbundesamt they are taking um, the sales numbers which are quite good for austria we have good statistics on the sales in austria uh, and assume a certain lifetime uh, operation time for that appliances to estimate the stock um, on a regional or provincial level, you can um, validate these estimations because there are already inventories on small scale systems. But this, as I mentioned, um, these inventories are not complete now. There are several um, efforts going on to do that. But currently, it, the, the inventory, the total inventory is based on sales numbers and uh, assumptions for the, for the lifetime of these appliances. ¿Cómo podría replicarse el ejercicio de mejora del inventario austriaco al de otros países? ¿Qué información se necesita para justificar el cambio del factor emisión? ¿Cree que se podría revisar eh, los factores de emisión de las guías de MEP de la Agencia Europea de Energía con la información derivada de sus estudios para que se beneficien otros países? En el primer step, it's not necessary uh, to revise um, the emission factors in the guidebook, because as you remember, the guidebook is already given the countries, giving the countries the options to take in tier two emission factors down to, let's say, approximately 30 or even some less uh, grams per gigajoule for pellet appliances. Um, of course, you can, um, they can revise that guidebook, but I know that uh, the people there are currently. Um, are always continuously uh, searching for new developments, uh, new studies. I guess this will be done um, automatically. But what's important for the countries is to put together, to select um, the data that is available or necessary. Sometimes it's not available. You have It has to be collected um, to justify the use of a smaller emission factor. Um, currently, if, 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 if I'm right, currently Spain, the best emission factor used in Spain for uh, domestic heating is 500 grams per gigajoule. Uh, I mean, that's uh, at least a factor of 10 or even a factor of 20 higher than modern systems um, uh, emit. So what you need for, for improving your, the emission inventory is some idea of the stock of appliances in different categories and the amount of fuel going into these different groups. Uh, so how many wood pellets, uh, how, many, how, many, uh, how much wood chips, uh, logwoods go into these different technologies. And there are different approaches how to do that. Of course, you could, can do an inventory, which is very complicated and, and a long um, project to, to know for each building which uh, appliance is installed and how much fuel goes into that uh, building. Uh, I guess for Spain, this is even um, a, a, a long lasting project. Or you can see if there are good estimations on the sales numbers, on the lifetimes, and maybe some um, regional or local uh, inventories uh, where that, that you take to just um, validate your overall calculation based on, on market numbers. But I think these are the two critical uh, parts. Uh, what is the stock of existing appliances? Also taking into account modern systems, but you need an overall picture and then multiply each of the groups with the tier two emission factors in the guidebook. And this will significantly change your result in the emission inventory. Hasta qué potencia consideran cuando hablan de sistemas de combustión de pequeña escala? Y si han hecho revisión de los factores de emisión para calderas de tamaño industrial residencial? Is based on the residential heating sector and the emission factors that we revised were, were just up to 500 kilowatt, which is the limit in the standard that we are referring to the EN3. Um, considering bigger size uh, boilers for district heating or also for industrial purposes, because these are different regulations, much lower thresholds already um, with filters installed and, and um, 
reg, uh, inspections every one or two years. Um, so this was focused on systems up to 500 kilowatts currently. ¿Qué papel jugarán los equipos de filtración, filtros de mangas, electrofiltros en los próximos años en relación a la reducción de emisiones, principalmente en calderas de biomasa pequeñas y medianas? Uh, I mean, we, what we see now from uh, almost all Austrian manufacturers is that they include and install wood chip boilers, um, at least in Germany, but also starting in Austria uh, with electro electrostatic precipitators. Um, currently, it's, it's not included in the emission inventory emission factors. Uh, what it requires is uh, field measurements Uh, long-term knowledge about the performance of these systems. We know it that they are pretty uh, working, uh, working pretty fine um, from lab measurements, but also from uh, in measurements after the installation. Um, what it requires is some more measurements on that technology, uh, and then it would be possible to introduce emission factors for biomass system for a certain fuel, including electrostatic precipitators. Um, my fear is that for, the, for that introduction of these emission factors, um, the data available is still not enough. It needs more measurements, um, but this will come because there are systems installed every day with such uh, configuration. Uh, and I estimate that um, the emission factor for such systems will even be lower than the best emission factors for pellets that we see now at around 20 milligrams per megajoule. Um, so it, it, it will, I guess it will go towards uh, approximately 10 or even less uh, grams per gigajoule or milligrams per megajoule. Los datos de Austria se han calculado asumiendo la calefacción doméstica residencial. Se utilizan leña forestal y pellet. ¿Se han considerado otras fuentes de biomasa? Eh, ¿Cómo debería hacerse en un país como España que hay uso de leña de frutales y olivo y el uso de hueso de aceituna? But, um, include um, different kind, types of fuels, as you mentioned, uh, no olive trees, no uh, olive pits. Uh, uh, so we, our, our estimation is based on the fuels that are used in Austria, which is uh, logwood, uh, wood chips and wood pellets. Um, and what this will require for the case of Spain is um, technology and fuel specific emission factors for these type of fuels and, and boilers. So um, we, we have some measurements on, on these kind of fuels, but mainly from development projects where, where Austrian manufacturers were developing boilers for specific fuels like um, olive stones or, or um, prunings, vineyard prunings but not a systematic approach where you can uh, calculate emission factors. So what I would suggest is for these relevant fuels to um, make these measurements uh, and provide to the national agency um, high quality emission factors for these um, systems. Because what the, what the agency needs is some kind of justification if they want to use national emission factors specific for their country. This is um, a positive approach, of course, if you have specific emission factors, but these need to be justified by measurements. And if you can do that, provide these measurements, maybe also together with the agency uh, in, a, in a joint project, in a joint study, uh, then they can be used in the emission inventory. But this, uh, you're, you're fully right. Uh, I mean, these um, common factors need to be um, specified for the fuels and the technologies used in the country. Um, there are some default values that they can use um, in, the, in the inventory guidebook, but you will not find default values for any combination of fuel and boiler that, that might be very important for, for Spain. ¿Cómo ha sido el diálogo con las agencias que realizan los cálculos de emisiones a nivel nacional? ¿Ha habido un diálogo sencillo y colaboración? Fue desde el principio o una vez obtenido ya los resultados? Question and, and I have um, several lessons learned. What we did is we were doing the research first. Uh, most of the projects were already finished. Um, 
But what we did is in all our research projects at a certain size of project, um, we invited the agency in some kind of advisory boards just to keep them informed what we are doing. And now we set up also some kind of task force, we call it in Austria, where the agency, we as a researchers, but also industries and local governments are sitting together and discussing the situation, discussing the problems, discussing the new research findings, but also discuss um, the, the missing links, I would say, the missing information uh, and maybe set up new research proposals to fill those gaps. So this is a learning from, um, from our history or, or my history. We should have done that earlier. We, did, we set it up uh, in 2020. So this task force, we call it air quality task force. This is something that I can uh, strongly advise uh, to any country to do that earlier bring together relevant stakeholders on one table and let each of the stakeholders um, on a first point, just um, tell the others their view on the situation and, and tell their needs, um, the problems maybe with the topic to give a better understanding of, of uh, all, all parts and um, all stakeholders. And that will definitely um, improve the situation, just talking to each other. And, and step by step, at least in Austria, um, the emission inventory was updated and we are now in a dialogue uh, and, and the agency is telling us what they need and we tell, we're trying to provide that information together with industry, also including the agency, of course. Han realizado medias de partículas 2.5 y 10 o han calculado sus factores de emisión a partir de las medidas experimentales de TSP. We're done for TSP. Uh, just some verification measurements uh, were performed where we did really size segregation in 2.5 PM10 and, and TSP. Uh, so most of the measurements um, that were used to recalculate emission factors are based on TSP and the fraction of PM10 and PM2.5 were simply calculated based on some uh, comprehensive measurements with size segregation and, and um, particle separators. Las emisiones reales medidas se dan de manera constante o en forma de picos claros de emisión. Si se dan en forma de pico, ¿qué importancia tiene? ¿Cómo afecta esto a los cálculos y qué se puede hacer al respecto? The emissions that were measured um, in our research project were not measured at constant load. They were measured uh, in, in uh, modulating mode in real life in the field. So, for instance, we installed the equipment and measured over 24 hours. So there are starts and stops and high loads and low loads. Um, we also tried to um, make such kind of measurements in the test stand in the laboratory. So to make um, um, dynamic testing methods for boilers uh, in the laboratory to estimate the emission factors. Um, and what we were able to do is to certify that it's possible to estimate um, a real life emission factor based on such kind of modulation testing uh, in the laboratory. But we've done both laboratory testing and field testing, both in dynamic or realistic testing conditions. Um, Modern boilers sí. do not necessarily perform worse in this in this modulation mode. Um, so there is, of course, for some boilers, a uh, little higher emissions in this in this dynamic mode with starts and stops. Um, but there are some boilers that even perform better in this uh, modulation mode. So there's not not a very very common picture for all the boilers. Um, but this is an important step. Uh, so it's. Um, it, it needs to, the assessment needs to be reflecting the real life operation. And depending on if this boiler is installed with a, with a buffer storage or not, this operation is different, of course. With a buffer storage, you can use some kind of constant load measurements with some addition for the starting and stopping. Um, if it's not the case, if you have no buffer storage, you need to do this uh, dynamic testing um, to estimate the emissions. There are several 
uh, very very big research projects um, that have uh, investigated that um, also a European research project where a Spanish partner CMAT was included um, and there is I think there is a, a good basic knowledge on how to test these appliances um, to do that further testing also for instance for Spanish fuels or um, for Spanish systems. Muchas gracias, Christoph, y gracias a todos por, por asistir a este webinario.